Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Uh, we are recording in Portland, Oregon at the studios of Open Signal, Portland Community Media Center. Uh, today we'll be speaking with Rob Wallace on his book, Big Farms Make Big Flu, Dispatches on Infectious Disease, Agribusiness, and the Nature of Science. Rob Wallace received a PhD in um, biology at the City University of New York uh, graduate Center and is a visiting scholar at the Institute for Global Studies, University of Minnesota. His training is as an evolutionary biologist. He has consulted on influenza for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and on eco-health at the Centers for Dise Disease Control and Prevention. Nelly finds himself, finds himself blacklisted because of the connections he draws between disease in the current stage stage of agribusiness. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's yeah. a pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, I'm very glad you're here. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. I'm going to hold this book up so that uh, maybe this camera can can uh, zoom in on that picture there. What is that? <laughs> What's <laughs> well, that got to do with that? It looks like a mess, and it's uh, people mistake it as a heart. People, uh, it's weird because it looks like it has a little eye in the middle, and it's mm -hmm. bizarre. It's actually a hand holding a bunch of goose guts, and the reason I put that on there is because I wanted to have a. Well, I should say that the publisher was not happy about that at all. <laughs> I mean, it's really uh, you've disturbed it's, that it's, it might. It's you, very gross. <laughs> yes, it might uh, attract people from wanting to buy it. Though, if you you know think about things, I think there are enough people who are attracted to that sort of thing that maybe we could get them a mm -hmm. bunch of sales that way. But um, ostensibly, um, the reason why I put that in there is because I, I wanted a visual uh, explanation point to emphasize that. Um, raising animals is not like making widgets. And uh, these are living beings. And uh, uh, as much as agribusiness tries to try to um, uh, turn it into a, a kind of industrial uh, factory in terms of raising animals and uh, processing them, um, and they do an amazing job at trying, uh, but in the end they really can't uh, turn animals into uh, things. But yeah. And, uh, and the pathogens that circulate among them, uh, among the livestock, among the poultry that they raise in this way, are uh, responding in kind. And so I call the book Big Farms Make Big Flu because I'm trying to emphasize that in the course of industrializing our animal production, our livestock production, uh, we are also industrializing the pathogens that circulate among them. Okay. Um, and I, I would assume that big agriculture is not pleased with anyone drawing that attention or that connection. Yes, well I would say up until now they've largely been able to escape um, attention on that regard. Um, and what they do is they, uh, there's a whole a language about biosecurity, about safe practices, about uh, oftentimes they, they uh, deflect attention onto other possible explanations for why, let's say, there's a big outbreak of uh, avian H5N2 in, in uh, the Midwest that occurred in 2015. So they'll, they'll blame the Chinese, or they'll blame wild waterfowl, or they'll bl blame small farmers, even their own contract farmers, for alleged violations in the company practices. But in the end, really, um, what they're trying to do is deflect attention from the fact that it's the economic model itself that's the source that's driving the evolution and spread of deadly pathogens. Okay, all right, so talk more about the economic model. Yes, well, um, the livestock revolution began before World War II, but really uh, picked up speed after the war. And so it started first in poultry in the southeastern parts of the United States. And in essence, they, uh, in, um, you have a, a, what's called a vertical integration of all the nodes of Production, so everything from fertilization, uh, eggs, all the way up through um, meat packing, and it all gets folded under one company's roof. And um, whereas prior to that, it was in separate in separate locations. That's correct. Okay, so different it, people were doing it, or different companies were doing it, or that's correct. Right. So it, all those were split off into their own little sect, uh, sectors. Uh, so you have small holders would say may have backyard chickens or maybe a little bit larger than that and then you would contract a trucker to take your 
um, flock to the city to be processed by a different um, independent um, meat packer. Um, and so now that gets all folded in, into under one roof. And uh, that's a way of uh, you're in, in essence engaging in these economies of scale where you know you don't have to put uh, as much money per unit of, of poultry or livestock that uh, you would if it was all separated out. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're dealing now with um, larger numbers of poultry and livestock. So you go from uh, you know, 70 million poultry to 6 billion. And uh, so you're increasing the, s the number of birds you're increasing the flock sizes, so you maybe instead of the backyard poultry of 70 chickens, now you're putting 15,000 turkeys in a barn, or 250,000 layers, uh, those are uh, chickens that lay eggs mm -hmm. in a barn. They're all genetically uh, the same now, so there's a certain homogenization in terms of the birds. Uh, the breeding is done specifically for uh, you know, morphometric characteristics, meaning like larger breasts, fast growth, so you're growing them fast, and uh, let's say broilers in six weeks. In essence, you're, you're producing, you're putting an adult size amount of meat on a, a juvenile bird, mm -hmm. and there's so much meat on these birds that they stumble around because they don't have the leg strength. Mm -hmm. um, and you are, uh, and that if you, if you think about it from the vantage of the pathogens, what you're doing is producing a system that, while it's excellent in terms of turning over profits, uh, quarterly profits, is also excellent for selecting pathogens uh, that are deadlier and transmit farther and faster than ever before. Um, the, the example, think of it this way, if you're, um, and we speak about virulence, that's the amount, that's the deadliness of the virus. Now, typically there's a cap on how much of a, of a deadly virus you can be. You're in a host, you can't kill your host before you can get into the next body. Mm -hmm. So there's a cap on how, how deadly oh, okay. you are. Mm -hmm. So you can only replicate within your host up to the transmission level that you need to get the next host, but it has to be timed right for when the next host comes about. And in the wild, you don't really come across other chickens or other uh, livestock and uh, animals that, that well, so typically virulence is capped. But if you're stuffed in a barn with 15,000 other, uh, 15, other turkeys, mm -hmm. the next body's right there. Mm -hmm. So that selects for a virus that can burn through the, through the, the barn as fast as it can beating out other strains that maybe aren't as virulent. So the, there's a relationship between how deadly the virus is and how fast it burns through a population. Hmm. And so, and these birds are all genetically the same, so you don't have the immunological fire breaks necessary to stop the virus. Um, and so that's within the, the barn level. Um, there's also the globalization that's going on. So you have influenzas on one side of the world are suddenly meeting up influenzas on the other side of the world because poultry and hog, for instance, are being shipped from one side of the world to the other in the ways they didn't do it previously. Mm -hmm. And there's footage, and you can find it online, I think, of um, a, a hog breeder in Manitoba getting hog onto a plane. And yes, pigs do fly, <laughs> and they're flying from Manitoba to Germany and then being shipped by truck to Krasnodar in Russia hmm. uh, because someone ordered this special type of hog breed. Mm -hmm. But I think that's how the influenzas are, are moving about from mm -hmm. one part of the, of the world to another. Mm -hmm. I remember when the Asian bird flu, oh, I don't remember what the specific yes. name was, but when they talked about that, they talked about it being spread by all the small farmers yes. and uh, bird keepers in, in Asia. Yes. But you're certainly suggesting that's not, that's not actually what happens. Well, they're in terms of and H5N1, that was the celebrity virus at the turn of the century, yeah. right? And each year we have these new celebrities, right? So uh, 2013, we get uh, H7N9. 2014, we get Ebola. 2015, we have H5N2. 2016, we get Zika. I mean, these mm -hmm. are like reality stars at this point. Mm -hmm. And they're coming in at greater frequency. And they have uh, they capture the the people's imagination, but in a in a in a has a, a a driving drama to it, but the 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 things necessary 
the things that are necessary to stop um, the, uh, uh, these pathogens aren't being addressed. So um, um, H5N1 spread from the hinterlands of Guangdong into the poultry factories of the area. Guangdong is the southern eastern, southeastern province in China, just across from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And then the virus spills over into Hong Kong. And so there's an air, there's a kind of a story of, you know, the smallholders cause this and Hong Kong is this victim. But if you look at the economics of it, Hong Kong, uh, once China went, became, uh, its economy became more liberalized, uh, Hong Kong began to s supply the capital necessary for Guangdong to make the changes in land use and poultry production that allow the virus to emerge in this way. Mm -hmm. So smallholders, can be a part of the equation. But what's interesting now is that the virus is, is changing. Uh, I don't know if you've been following the news, but uh, across uh, Europe and Asia now, there's a new strain of influenza called H5NX. Uh, and it's uh, the daughter of H5N1. There's a whole bunch of them, H5N2, H5N3, H5N5, H5N6, H5N9. They keep rotating out the end part. Hmm. Um, and that. Uh, so, um, what's interesting about it is that some of the scientists have looked at the kind of uh, ecological niches that this virus goes toward, the places, the combination of factors that allows the virus to prosper. And that H5NX is, has more of an affinity directly for in industrial poultry. Hmm. So the story of influence is complex because you've got wildlife, wild waterfowl, you've got smallholders, you've got industrial poultry, and so you do have these uh, Incredible, strange ecological cascades that may accrue from one place to the other, but there's no doubt that the H5NX is is specific to uh, industrial poultry in a way that it wasn't before. Hmm. And who wouldn't want to go there? Look at all the food. Uh, it's all yeah. food for flu. You can just burn right through. Mm -hmm. Billions upon billions upon billions of poultry and hog that are now available for these flus too. And there's no nothing that's stopping those pathogens. There's no uh, diversity in the animals, um, and the biosecurity uh, bio is incapable of keeping something microscopic from getting into these barns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just um, in, in your book, you talk about coffee and how coffee is grown and what it, how coffee that is grown in shade forests is different than the coffee that's commercially grown. Yes. Talk about that a little bit. Yes, well, that's something of the other direction, yeah, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. And this gets into uh, uh, kind of the what direction would we go instead of this way? If this is yes, if so going right. being industrial is, is not the way to go, what do we do? Yeah. Well, we kind of would want something in the other direction, something that includes um, more diversity in the animals involved, um, something that uh, would allow potentially allow the ecology itself to tamp down pathogen outbreaks. Um, and so the example is, is, is some work done by people at the uh, University of Michigan, uh, Yvette Perfecto and John Vandermeer, ecologists who went down to Mexico, and they looked at how shade coffee as a system protects itself from uh, various pests that would hit, that hit coffee as a crop. Mm -hmm. And so you have all sorts of species of ants and bats and birds that feast and control by these ecological cascades, these pests from damaging the, the coffee crops. And, and to me, in my mind, it really speaks to like, what, what is the cutting edge science of the 21st century? Because it isn't, it isn't necessary, it's not GMOs, however ingenious they might be, and it's not automatic feeders in barns that's the cutting edge. Um, it, the cutting edge of science, I think, in this regard is how do we get the, our economy to start speaking again to the ecology under, uh, under which and by which we grow our food. And so the notion of can we use the ecology that naturally emerges out of the relationships, say, in a, in a shade forest 
Can we use that as a way of helping control our pests without petrochemical pesticides mm -hmm. or fertilizer or, or things like that? Mm -hmm. uh, because Earth provides a lot of the uh, things we need to grow things already, and so why destroy the very thing that provides us our, our, our wealth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. One, one thing I got from reading that chapter uh -huh. was that coffee, of course, was not native to, to Mexico. Right. And that, in spite of that, uh, when it got there, uh, nature by itself created the systems to protect, right. uh, protect the coffee, and to protect itself, really. It's, it wasn't just about protecting the coffee, it was how nature figured out how to integrate all of this into a, a continuous system that supported itself. Yeah, and you know, it, it's hard to talk about these things without making kind of anthropomorphic uh, uh, you know, allusions to nature doing things on purpose. But mm -hmm. in essence, you know, even if this coffee was brought in from Ethiopia, uh, you know, at some point, uh, nature, uh, animals have a way of this, uh, displaying uh, agency or, or arriving at um, uh, mutualisms and interactions and competitions that uh, will often typically stabilize. It's not always always the same that way. Sometimes nature will, something will happen, <laughs> uh, for, you know, an earthquake happens or a flood and, and they wipe the, the slate clean and you start again. But the, the fact that animals and plants uh, will interact on this ecosystemic level and as e ecosystems generates the kind of relationships that allow uh, pathogens to be, con pests to be controlled. And it's our hypothesis why Ebola did so much damage in 2014, 2015. I mean, here it is, you have a vir uh, Ebola, a terrible virus that used to spill over in Central America, hit a, a village uh, every couple of years, hit a, a guerrilla troop, wiped them out, terrible virus. But it was, in essence, um, concentrated to the, the deep forest. All of a sudden, 2013 through 2015, you have a virus that go that becomes urbanized, uh, infects 28 to 35,000 people, and kills 11,000 people, living bodies in the streets of, of the West African capitals. I mean, how did how did that happen? Mm -hmm. And they look at the genetics of the virus, and it really wasn't that different. I mean, as it began to go human to human, it changed a bit. But at the start, the virus itself was not that different. Mm -hmm. you know, same uh, same deadliness, same clinical course, same uh, serial transmission rates. Uh, so what, what accounts for this shift in a virus that was hitting villages now and then to this almost just about nearly regional kind of outbreak that we were all worried would go pandemic? Mm -hmm. And it's our hypothesis, and I think data is starting to roll in that we may actually be right on this one, um, that in the course of uh, imposing a particular type of economy on the region, in this case a kind of neoliberal econ uh, economy, is a kind of a laissez-faire uh, kind of economy, meaning a ripping down the trade barriers to allow companies to come, international com companies to come in, in essence, to turn the region into uh, uh, the playpen for the, some of the richest countries, uh, uh, companies in the world. And you know that leads to massive amount of logging and mining and monoculture production. And you're taking the complex forest that uh, can control these pests by virtue of, a, you know, the virus can't line up all these susceptibles one after the other because of the nature of the complex relationships the animals and plants share in the forest. But once you strip that out and simplify it, most of the hosts will die off and their pests and, and pathogens will die off. But some of the pathogens have, in essence, hit the jackpot. Mm -hmm. So, in, in our, how we describe it is, is we are hooking the mechanism of how Ebola emerged on palm oil. So palm oil uh, is, is one of the larger, um, it, it's, it's the fastest, one of the fastest growing uh, uh, cash crops in the world, but the land is, 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 uh, is drying up in uh, places like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, there's not enough land to produce, it to meet market demands. So they're starting to look at places like the Congo and the Amazon to grow this stuff, mm. which breaks my third grader heart, because I remember in third grade, like, understanding deforestation was going on, but seeing in maps the Amazon and the Congo and understanding that we wouldn't dare 
uh, you know, deforest those places because they provide the oxygen of the, the mm -hmm. lungs of the earth. Mm -hmm. But here we are, we're doing exactly that. Um, and so we're, uh, many of these companies are coming in and, and uh, deforesting these areas. And what it does is that it opens up, it allows some of these pathogens t uh, to line up the susceptibles necessary. So here we have, for instance, uh, some of the frugivore bats, bats that eat fruit. They are apparently the reservoir for many of these Ebolas. Mm. And they're not stupid. When their forest is ripped down, they're going to go where the food is. Uh -huh. And now the food is this, these uh, palm oil monocultures. And what's not to like about them? There's food, there's shelter, there aren't any predators, mm -hmm. nice spaces so you can fly from roosting uh -huh. to foraging. And so in essence, you've increased the interface between the humans and the bats, which allows the spillover to happen. So that's on the supply and the front end of how neoliberalism has a, a impacted the, the emergence, likely emergence of Ebola. The other end, of course, is something I think a lot of people recognize, the structural adjustment programs in which countries have to, in order to get loans, they have to reduce their outlays toward uh, public health and animal health infrastructure. And so when Ebola, someone with Ebola shows up at a local hospital, you don't have the resources necessary to isolate the person or even uh, recognize it as Ebola and not some other disease like loss of fever. And so all of a sudden, the virus has the capacity to develop momentum on both ends, both from its origins out of the forest and also once it reaches into the human population. And so it it's explodes through West Africa. Wow, that yeah. is, a, <laughs> that, that is a, a very scary story. Yeah. So uh, we have six minutes left, and I certainly want to cover uh, your thoughts about what we do. Oh, what do we do next? What do we do next? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How uh, do we counter this? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, I th when you know when, you, when we talk about these things and we uh, there's a certain kind of a, a air of uh, the apocalypse about uh, it. Yes, I, uh, right. I yeah, do. Yeah. But yeah. I do actually at the same time retain considerable hope, and the hope comes from and the way I describe it is that agribusiness is bringing Americans and the rest of the world together because yeah. everybody hates agribusiness. Mm -hmm. And it isn't merely the animal rights activists, it isn't just foodies who uh, complain about the lack of nutrition, the processing. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't just uh, about the labor activists who don't like the fact that people who work in the uh, farms are treated as much as sides of beef as the cattle or livestock that they're tending. It's that, um, and it's not just from we epidemi epidemiologists who are now waking up and understanding that, that this is, um, uh, uh, a problem. We don't want to be in a position of selecting a virus that kills a billion people. Um, so, but I think overall, there's a, uh, we, even within agribusiness, there's an understanding that that sector is losing what's called this thick legitimacy, meaning it's, it used to be when agribusiness spoke, it spoke for food. Mm -hmm. It used to be when agribusiness exercised power, it didn't do anything because that was the machinery of society acting in its favor. Now it's starting to sweat bullets because it's beginning to understand that people do not accept the premises under which produc and production is being taken place on, on all sorts of levels, whether it's animal rights, the quality of the food, or epidemiology. And uh, I guarantee you that if you want to look there are this, the agribusiness versions of the cigarette papers or the climate change papers of Exxon in the library at Cargill or some of these other companies. They understand what's happening. And there is a, is a smell of desperation on their part to continue uh, producing this uh, food this way because it makes a lot of money. But I think people are starting to put the things together that mm -hmm. instead we need to be able to connect the ecology and economy back together in a way that all those things that we need that we have ostensibly taken for granted are, in, are need to be protected. So the quality of our waters, the quality of our food, the, how people are treated as they work, uh, all these things, the fact that we don't want, we need to protect ourselves from viruses that circulate in, in, these, uh, in these operations. All these things are starting to converge in a way. And you know, I'm kind of tired of talking, contradicting agribusiness. I, I will continue to do that. But the most interesting conversations I'm beginning to have is with all sorts of people who have new ideas about where to go forward, including along the lines of the mm -hmm. agroecology that we talked about with mm -hmm. the coffee. Mm -hmm. But that's it, how we do that from place to place 
is the cutting edge science of the 21st okay. century. Yeah, so not thinking collectively how we do this, but yeah. thinking individually. What would you recommend for me oh, for you. to do? Well, I mean, I think, uh, I, I don't have, I could talk to you about, you know, choosing some products over others. I don't think that consumer choice is going to be enough. I mean, there has to be political organization. Mm -hmm. At some point, we have to figure out how to smash the power of the political power the agribusiness has. Because you go any state capital here, uh, across the United States or even across the world, they have lobbyists and they are they exercise their power in that way. And somehow we have to uh, break that hold on our democracies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and, and one of my favorite topics yeah. and things that I am always active in is getting big money out of politics. Yes. And most certainly that is one thing uh, that's indirect. Yes. that could have a beneficial effect on this. Absolutely. Uh, right, yeah. And, and uh, I also uh, have become a vegetarian yes. uh, so that my meat consumption is down to zero. Yes, yes. I actually, well, fish, yes. uh, although, uh, you, know, uh, you know, thinking about fish, you know, not factory farm fish, but right. wild caught fish, uh, things like that, that, I, I, that I, I at least like to think or, you know, are making some difference, at least in the long run, if right, not right. the short run. So, right, sure. yeah. So, uh, I want to thank you very much sure. for being here. Absolutely. This has been a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, show, and I, I appreciate that. We still have uh, a minute. Uh -huh. A message that you want to just send to the audience, of, of, uh, anything at all? Sure. Um, I would say that um, I think uh, I think w we are in a position. I think that the des our, our desire and our, to change things uh, for the better in terms of how uh, we deal with agribusiness and how do we change our food system. Uh, I think I take great hope and courage in how people from all walks of life are con converging on the notion that we have to do something different. And I, I, I love the fact that people are starting to look to each other for a way to go forward. And I think um, in the way that scientists and farmers and uh, people in everyday life are really in a position uh, to change the world for the better. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it seems these are dark days, but I also think that uh, we really are in a place to be able to to change things for the better. Great. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So we've been talking with uh, Rob Wallace, author of Big Farms Make Big Flu, and um, uh, I, I, I will say that one of the, one of my delightful things that I've seen recently is a, a friend of mine who I hadn't talked to in years has a farm close by, organic. He grows chickens, and he sent me a picture of eggs. Yes. Color of the rainbow. Yes. And yes. it was like, wow. We can do this. We, yeah, we can. can do this. Great, yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate right. that. Right, right.